Hey guys, time for some more tutorials. I am Magnet, and today let's talk about playing late game TVT. Uh, this is probably one of my most favorite stages of any matchup. There's just tons of crazy stuff that can come out. Really, any unit is viable by this stage of the game. So uh, let's go ahead and talk about it. We're going to talk a lot about transitioning into the late game appropriately, uh, making sure you're reacting to what your opponent builds, and really it's going to come down to huge fights and you need to know what's important in those big battles and what isn't so you can refine your composition and get an advantage. So let's go ahead and jump in here and we'll just try to kind of, whoops, press the wrong buttons already. We'll just kind of skip forward to the late game um, and we'll start talking about the video from that point but I do want to kind of make little notes about the uh, the games on our way there. So. This is Dream vs. Cure. This was from, I believe, Code A of Season 1. So these replays are fairly old, but the meta in the late game especially really hasn't changed very much, and I think really the only balance difference is Ghost Energy upgrades is still in the game, but that doesn't really matter. So uh, both these guys just scouting out to see where each other are. Both of them opening Reaper, interestingly enough, and this is partially because of the size of the map. They want to figure out what's going on sooner rather than later. So... Yeah, both of them going Reaper, even a second Reaper on the way as well. And of course, uh, as far as late game is concerned, no player should really have an advantage throughout the game. It's really going to come down to um, when it's super deep in the game, what you need to be doing at those stages if the game happens to go long. It can be because either player can't kill one another for quite a long time, but even still you might have a lead, you might not. So we're going to talk about all sorts of different situations. Both these guys opening up with a pretty fast Hellion uh, build here, or at least it looks like Cure is. Dream, I'm not so sure if he's opening up the same thing. No, it looks like he's just going to go cloak Banshees. So we've talked about Banshees, we've talked about unit compositions already, so you can go back and watch those videos, which we will kind of uh, skim over here for a little while. Again, we're not going to pay too much attention to these. We're just going to wait until the late game starts to show up a little bit more. If anything piques our interest on the way there, we will definitely talk about it. It's so just defending from the drops here, getting these back bases. I should note that uh, late game is going to occur a lot more frequently on huge maps. So this is definitely a huge four-player map. And just the raw distance between the bases is going to mean that uh, the defender will always have a big advantage. And typically when the defender always has a big advantage, that tends to favor later and later gameplay. So... Looks like we have a little bit of a move out here, it's just tank. It looks like uh, Cure is actually playing mech, so he's got that all taken care of. And on the other side, Dream is definitely going Bios. This is definitely mech versus Bio, which we've talked about a lot already. And uh, nothing too surprising is going on here, just tanks, uh, Hellbats, uh, Banshees being mixed in here and there, Ruins and also Vikings and stuff. All very normal. Uh, for the most part, uh, once you realize that you're going to have a hard time breaking your opponent, so let's start talking about this from Dream's perspective a little bit. We'll let this run. And that is, uh, you have this big bio force out here, you have some tanks. If you see this army, there's no way you're really ever going to be able to boost in there, and, or rather, not boost in there, but stim in there, and take that down. So, you need to be start thinking, once you start approaching max out types of situations, maybe I should take extra bases, which is what Dream is doing right now. Maybe I should just add on more production and I should just start getting ready to play a later game if I can't break him and he's just playing super defensive. So the mech player is typically going to be the one that kind of sits back and waits and the bio player is really often the one that forces it in the late game by just deciding that I'm probably not going to be able to break him anytime soon so I'm just going to start transitioning sooner rather than waiting for a long time. One really cool thing Kira is doing throughout this though is he's adding on a lot of Vikings and that's going to be really helpful because the late game typically comes down to who has a better air army. Uh, the ground army isn't that important, especially because there's not really a very many good ground to air type of units. A little bit of a drop going on here, by the way. The, the only real ground to air type of units that are available with mech are like Thors and Mines, and they're not typically what's going to push into the late game. What's going to push into the late game are things like battle cruisers, ravens, stuff like that. So if you start off with a big Viking advantage, then as soon as they decide to make that switch, which we're kind of starting to see Kira get into it right now. By the way, just another little bit of a fight, nothing too crazy going on here. Uh, and like I said, neither player is going to be broken considering this is about late game. So Kira is starting to figure out that uh, this is going to be kind of a longer game here. So he's adding on an extra star port, or at least I saw it building. Yeah, there we go. So he's starting to figure out this is going to go for a longer game, and I need to start adding star ports probably around the time when I start taking my fourth base. Um, is a good time to do it. Now on the other side we'll note that Dream has had his fourth base up for a long time so he has a big advantage as far as getting to that point. 
And let's also note that eventually your worker count is going to start to eat into your army really heavily. So right now Dream is at 192 supply and it looks like he's 20 supply ahead. This is all in workers. So once you get to this phase of the game where you're maxing out, you want to dump your workers down to about maybe 40. And you want to replace a lot of that with mule mining. So that means you definitely need the extra command centers. So Dream is pretty much maxed right now. He has 83 workers and he has about 1400 minerals. He's going to want to find a stage where he can dump a bunch of SCVs, transform these, these minerals into more command centers, orbital commands that is, and just land mules so you can have an army that's more like 160 supply rather than what it is now, which is, uh, I mean, you can factor out the differences here, 83 minus, or 192 minus 83 is 111. So if you could have 50 more supply in your army because you're dumping SCVs, then that's definitely a bonus that's going to be uh, really helping you in these later game fights. It's just a matter of time before one of these players starts to really heavily commit to a switch and it start, it's going to start out by being Kiri. He's going to start adding in Banshees, he's going to start adding on a lot more Vikings here and he's just going to say, you know, with my tanks that I have left over here, if I can just deal with the amount of Marines that are left in this army by the way, a huge movement right there, that was really sloppy out of Dream. But if I can deal with this uh, big, or rather, if I can deal with the remnants of the ground army, then all of a sudden he can't really check against what I have in the skies. I have Vikings here, I have Banshees that can start picking off Marines and Marauders. I have Ravens that I can use against the Marauders, and I can start using, like, PDDs and uh, Seeker Missiles and stuff like that. So, since both these players are starting to sense it, they're starting to add on the stuff that they should. Even more command centers added here for Cure. You can see he has three command centers here at his third base, as well as one getting ready at his fourth. So... We're definitely starting to finally enter that late game phase where uh, both players are just going to be massing up into these giant, scary armies, and uh, it's really just all about what type of compositions are going to help you win. And this is what I'm talking about here. If you can start uh, picking away with these uh, Banshees, then you can force them to engage into your tanks. And if you can trade out supply that way, you might just win the game that way. And you'd be surprised at how effective this is. So basically, with the last of your tanks, I mean, he really hasn't made tanks for quite a long time. That's not really what he wants to do from this point. He wants to just start switching into basically pure sky armies. But the leftover tanks that you have here, you might as well try to trade them out the best you can. And you can use this Banshee to try to force them to engage into you. And you can blow stuff up with your tanks and uh, get a good trade that way. But the idea is just to keep these Banshees alive, to keep your Vikings alive, and start getting into raids and whatnot so that you can uh, get the air advantage in the late game so that this ground army just ceases to matter like we've been talking about. So Banshee's still being annoying here. You can notice that Dream doesn't want to commit forward because he doesn't want to lose anything. Vikings and stuff can take over the skies. Banshee just gets sniped. That was a little bit lazy. Even more command centers too. There's two more on the way. There's one here and one over here. So just adding on tons upon tons of command centers when you're maxed out is a good play in TVT so you can start get, getting rid of SCDs. You'll notice that uh, there were some drops and stuff over here, and these SCVs are all starting to get hurt. But that's actually helping Dream get rid of these SCVs anyway. So drops by this phase of the game are really not a big deal. Uh, I wouldn't think about starting to harass your opponent by this phase of the game, because them losing workers is like, well, big deal. I mean, I would rather have the army supply anyway, so drops aren't really a, a factor. And we'll notice that Kira's still doing quite a bit of work with this army, even though he's still trying to enter this uh, late game phase still doing what he should behind this, that is, producing more air units. You'd really like to see him add on some more star ports here so that we could uh, get a better feel for, or rather get a better army advantage rather than reproducing tanks, which aren't really going to do much. Um, eventually you'll get to the point where uh, you're going to have a lot of banshees out here, maybe five or six, or maybe you could already start transitioning into battlecruisers. And once you kill off the marines, there's really nothing left for the other player to start dealing with this army. So. This is accelerating a little slow. Uh, this very gradual Raven and produ Viking production is going to get him there eventually. But you'd like to see him add on a fusion core. You'd like to see him start transitioning into a much deeper stage of the game. Of course, you really do need to focus on not dying throughout this whole phase as well. But uh, getting there safely is definitely very important. So start moving forward just a little bit. Adding on a bunch of turrets is cure right now, realizing that a huge doom drop might be a little bit of a problem. I know we said that drops aren't really that big of a concern, but uh, if the other player has a ton of medevacs and they load everything up and decide to just take over your main, that could be a problem. I mean, you, little little drops aren't a big deal, like killing a handful of SCVs, but losing in the control of your production line definitely is a big problem. So don't want to make that seem like I was just understating the uh, importance of... Um, 
of drops. So Dream in the background, he's adding on even more command centers, taking every, even more bases. This is what you want to do, is you want to just keep expanding all around the map the best you can. Considering if you ever just mine yourself out, then that's a, that's a bad thing. By the way, you're hearing tons of scans from this point forward because knowing where your opponent is is a very important thing. So you've heard, you've heard basically non-stop scans. Dream's going to do a little bit of damage here, but there's a whole bunch of command centers. He can just lift those up and keep those alive for a little while. He's starting to add on even more star ports like he was supposed to quite a while ago. And these, these units are basically just sacrificial from Dream. He doesn't really care too much because he has a pretty big bank behind this that he can resupply with. But I think Dream is actually being a little bit too slow about transitioning into the late game phase. He's sticking more so on the Marine Marauder tank medevac type of composition, whereas Cure is really starting to refine his composition into things like Vikings, Banshees. He still has a lot of tanks left over. His Vikings are landed right now, which I don't think should be, and he lifts them up. And these four Ravens are huge, and they're really going to dictate the types of battles that you can pick here. So um, if anything decides to just run and stim in there, he can drop Seeker missiles on it. He can use a lot of point defense drones against these Marauders. These Ravens are worth a lot, and a Raven count of about five is just devastating. You can't overstate its value by this point. And look how much uh, Kira can easily just push around Dream despite having the inferior supply. It's all about composition here, because he can keep these these uh, Banshees alive for quite a while. These Ravens have a lot of uh, Seeker missiles and point defense drones they can drop down. Or at least they would if they didn't spend their energy already on point defense drones. So this type of composition, even though he's behind by supply and has been for a little while, it's all about composition in the late game. And, uh, I mean, we, we've stated that several times. We really just want to see it in action here. Notice that Cure is resupplying in tanks. So if, if your opponent isn't transitioning super hard into the late game, then you can still continue on this tank production. But I think, honestly, two more starports of things like Banshees would actually be a lot better against this type of composition. Because then once you kill this very low amount of Marines in here, which I selected the Marauders, so it's only six Marines, the, the Banshees could kill everything. So... Uh, you'll kind of pin your opponents in bad situations like this. You can see Kira's really pushing them around, mainly because of that compositional advantage. Only a couple Marines here once again, and the Banshees are really the key to killing these uh, Marines off and being able to just whittle it down to units are really not going to do too much. So this is just a classic example of composition is definitely going to be a big deal. So uh, let's quit this replay as I feel like I've been repeating myself for a little while, and let's watch one more that's going to involve a lot more play with battle cruisers as they will start to dictate the game once they start to show up on the field. So, Dream versus Ryong is what we're seeing next. And uh, it, notice once again, it is a Dream, just by coincidence. Uh, mostly just because it's really hard to find TVT replays that play out like this. So, let's take a look at this one, and based upon how we saw everything play out from the last game, you'd expect Dream to be the one that didn't really transition the way he was supposed to, but uh, this game is going to prove a little bit different. So once again, we're going to have to kind of wade through kind of a long game before we get to the late game. So I'm going to play it pretty much on fast forward for the whole time, unless there's something very important to say. We'll just note these guys' builds, since getting a good feel for this matchup is always good. Ryong looks like he went gas first, opening up with a Cloak Banshee. So he should be dropping that down and starting up the uh, Banshee, and hopefully the Cloak here pretty soon. Looks like he got his gas a little bit too late and decided just to go Raven instead. So this is a pretty weird uh, defensive build here from Young, from Ryong. Back at home, though, with Dream, he went for a faster command center, so he's gotten the better end of these, uh, these builders so far. Mixing in a little bit of uh, mine harassment there, pretty cool stuff from Dream. Now the Banshees start up here from Dream and the later Cloak. Uh, Ryong obviously should be totally fine with this and the Raven. Um, I feel like I should mention the possibility of going for late game a little bit earlier than you probably should. Um, the way that TVTs mostly play out is players won't really start thinking about those deep transitions until they're at least on three bases. If you start trying to get a lot of Banshees and a lot of Vikings and Battlecruisers on two bases, then you really leave yourself too open to getting run over by a lot of other unit compositions, especially ones with a lot of Marines. And that's why you'll see players make up to maybe eight or ten tanks before they seem even interested in transitioning. So I don't want you to get into the idea that battlecruisers, while they're great in the late game, they're not something you want to just rush for and try to win the game that way. It's, it's super rare, and honestly, your opponent should be able to deal with that more often than not. So this game, once again, we're seeing Mech versus Bio. Ryung is playing Mech and Dream, of course, playing Bio. He doesn't really play any other, than, any other style than a really drop-heavy Bio. 
He is mixing in a handful of tanks here, but once again, this is going to break down to a point where neither player can really break the other, so they're going to have to start thinking about transitioning eventually. You can see some cool uses of the Raven right there, dropping Seeker missiles on the tanks, which is a good way to eliminate those. It's like a decent number of SCVs were lost, and like we talked about, Dream is a very drop-heavy Terran, so he's just going to go ahead and drop into the main, try to kill as much as he can. Don't think he really got too much. He did get a handful of SCVs though, so that's pretty nice. He's just going to continue this harassment here. Ryung has a responsibility to try to break this the best he can, but uh, honestly, these can be a little bit tough. And if you're Dream here, and if you're dealing this much damage to him, but you can't quite kill him, whoops, I'll just keep this playing. If you're dealing a lot of damage, but you can't quite kill him, this is when you might want to start to think about hey, I'm on four bases, I'm mining gas on four bases, maybe I should start transitioning a little early and try to catch him off guard. Because right now, Ryung is going to be very worried about the composition of Dream. And he's going to say, well, there's a lot of bio here, there's a lot of tanks, I need a lot of tanks. And if you can kind of fool your opponent into that mentality and switch into battle cruisers really quickly, then they'll have a hard time catching up most of the time. So this position, I think from Dream, I would actually just go back home realizing that I've done quite a bit of damage and I should have a decent supply lead here, I would go back home and try to transition into the late game quicker than the opponent will really expect, especially since he's up a base in mining, and he absolutely knows that right now. So uh, you, we should hopefully see that sooner rather than later, and that's something that you can employ in your own games, but you definitely can't throw away armies like this. He is trying to drop in the meantime, so this is him just kind of... Uh, giving the lead a little bit back to Ryung in some senses. I mean, Ryung definitely is on the back foot still, but Dream is uh, being a little bit risky here. He definitely could transition to the late game a little faster than we're seeing right now. But um, getting upgrades in the late game as well, something you really want to think about. Things like building armor, things like turret range, those are all things you're going to want to think about getting no matter what, just so that your planetaries will last a little bit longer, your turrets will do a little better, stuff like that. Now we're starting to see a very interesting transition here from Dream. Well, notice in the last game, and I'm not sure if this game was played before or after the last game, but our Dream is thinking, you know, if my opponent starts to mix in Banshees and starts to go for more late game stuff, maybe I should preempt that a little bit and start a Thor and get that out instead. Um, and we're seeing a transition here from Dream as well. You can see him adding on the two star ports. I don't know where they are. It looks like they're right here. And uh, he's starting to, to add on his more later game production. So even if you're the bio player, you can be the one to start pushing this forward into the later stages of the game and taking a little bit more of a defensive stance. Granted, he is still out on the map. He's mostly just trying to prevent a fourth base from being mined from. But he knows, okay, I'm maxed out. Um, there should be a point when I can start transitioning. And if he was learning from a previous game, say the one we just saw, then he would say, I need to transition by starting to find a way to get the air advantage so I can start with a Thor, and then maybe I can start just flooding out a lot of Vikings or a lot of Ravens, depending on whatever I can afford. So Dream's going to start transitioning into that. And we'll note that if you're a mech, you will have the upgrades going for your air units a lot faster. But for the bio player, it's not too bad just to go for upgrades throughout the game anyway, especially if you're, lo if you're using tanks, because that can start contributing to um, a lot better army as the game goes on. So a little bit of battles here, not too much. You'll notice that tons of scans are being dropped. Let's take a look at their incomes and look at Ryung sitting at about 60 workers, Dream at about 70. Dream can still afford to throw away a lot of workers. And by the way, the funny thing is that look at Ryung's production right now. Two Banshees are coming out and he's already expecting that with the Thor that he produced. So he's definitely on top of what's going on here. And if the Banshees show up, they're going to have a lot harder time dealing with this type of army. Wherein it's very marine light, but killing a, a Thor with Banshees is actually pretty hard, so he's doing much better than the last game, and he's kind of pre-judging where Ryung's going to go with this late game transition, and starting to get on top of it a lot better. And here we go, here's the fusion core coming down right now, that means there's going to be battle cruises on the way, and note how many starports we're going to see here. There's one, and there's two, three, and three more on the way, so he's going to have a ton of production once this all, start, all starts going. And note that he has a ginormous bank right now, and in the late game especially, you need to be able to spend this money really quickly. So what we're probably going to see is we're probably going to see eventually Ryung is going to try to break this army, or Dream is going to try to do his best to crash in here and reduce as much of Ryung's units as possible. One or the other is definitely going to happen, but when that happens, Dream will have the advantage of having all this late game production already ready to go, so he can dump his money right away into units that are going to, that are going to help him out right away. So we'll see this breaking point eventually, and when that happens, he's definitely going to start swapping out his supply, 
And here comes one side of it right now, just trying to crush down these tanks. So he's already lost about 20 supply right away. He immediately resupplies with Ravens and Vikings, which are definitely going to be your best uh, air support. So the battle cruiser should be starting here in just a little bit. He should add on tech labs onto these uh, starports more than likely. You can add reactors, but you don't typically need that many Viking, uh, or rather that much Viking production. Ryung's just barely starting to crawl out to get the space secured, but he is refining his unit composition the way he thinks is the right way to do it. And the funny thing is that if you're uh, ever the player that's not going Banshee and you're able to just take over the air lead, then all of a sudden those Banshees are pretty worthless. So a lot of scans being dropped here, and that's definitely the name of the game in TVT is knowing what your opponent is doing at all times. Here come those BCs, and uh, the support for everything is definitely on the way as well. So let's check out Ryung's production right now. It's pretty hilarious. Four command centers on the way at a time. Uh, Raven energy being upgraded. Raven turret uh, upgrades being researched, and that's a lot of... Uh, I guess it also contributes to point defense drones, but that's those two upgrades are definitely going to help your Ravens out quite a bit, and uh, both of them getting the, the right upgrades as far as uh, upgrading their late game units as well. Here's even three more command centers on the way for Dreams, so this is playing out exactly the way you really want to play late game TVT, is a lot of command centers, less SCVs, neither one of them has re have really dumped too aggressively, and a huge flying army. So there's the third battle cruiser on the way, and once Ryung figures this out, he might be in a little bit of a rough spot. If you're not ahead in the Viking count and they're using battle cruisers, then there's going to be really no way you're going to be able to break that. By the way, Yamato on the way for the battle cruisers. Definitely want to get that so they can at least shoot down a few Vikings uh, during a battle. Maybe even pick off some Ravens if they get some good shots there. Ryung's starting to realize that this is a this is inevitability, and we're going to see a big trade come up here, where both these armies are going to be reduced quite heavily. But Dream is going to have a big advantage because he's been ahead in mining this whole game, and he's going to be able to uh, switch into a better supply a lot faster because he'll just have a lot more money. So you should see a big attack come up here fairly soon, as Dream did stim his whole army but didn't attack. That was a little weird. But uh, Dream's got to do something about this eventually. Now the Banshees start to move forward, and uh, we're starting to see Ryung take a little bit of a lead because he does have that compositional advantage that we were talking about in the last game. There's even more point defense drones intercepting Thor shots, so the army of Ryung looks terrifying right now, and it's all just because he started to transition quicker than Dream really did, or at least that's what Ryung thinks, because there's a big army waiting back here for Dream as well. Two Ravens, two battle or three battle cruisers, a lot of Vikings, and he's still pouring out even more battle cruisers and even more Vikings. And Ryung really has no idea. So if he ever loses this air army, if he gets hit by a bunch of seeker missiles or something, and the battle cruisers still are alive, then that's a that's a big thing to deal with. It's, it costs a lot of money typically to deal with these battle cruisers, unless you can transition appropriately. So we'll have to see what Ryung's response is once he realizes what's going on. I don't think he quite knows yet. Now he has to know because he just scanned over top of a battle cruiser, and he's got to realize that oh man, I've been behind in income this entire game. My force isn't that strong. I need to continue to refine it, and I can't afford to fight until I'm a better spot there. So Ryung starts to add on more starports here. On the other side, Dream taking even more bases as we can see, adding on planetaries here over at some random bases that are going to be blocking Ryung from taking that. So a lot of cool stuff going on here, but uh, we're eventually going to see the big sky fight that we've been waiting for as the battle cruisers start to rally forward. And here we go. This is uh, this is what these big battles often come down to. Um, the biggest thing you really want to be sure of is that you win the Viking battle. And right now, Ryung has way more Vikings than uh, Dream. And the reason you want to win the Viking battle is because Vikings outrange everything else. If you have a seeker missile come down on your army, you can just fly away. If uh, there's battle cruisers only left, you can actually kite against those in the sense that you can, the Vikings will outrange in the battle cruisers, so you can shoot them and then fly away a little bit and shoot them and just stay out of the range of the battle cruisers the entire time. But these types of fights are exactly what you're going to see in the late game. And it really comes down to who gets better engagements. Something cool that you can do that you don't see very often is you can actually mix ghosts in here to try and EMP the Ravens. And if you EMP your opponent's Ravens and you still have full Raven energy, then you should be able to win those fights easily just by dropping Seeker missiles, point defense drones, turrets, whatever you got to do. Just throw them down there, get everything cast as soon as possible, and then micro your Vikings if they need to be microed. 
if you're the battle cruiser user here you need to know when to quit and uh, the time to quit is either when you force him to leave because you're dropping seeker missiles on his viking clump or when you just have no more support for them you need to just go back maybe into some turrets or over marines or something so you can protect your battle cruisers so let's watch this fight uh, break down we'll watch it in slower uh, speed so we can see everything that's going on here both of them just spamming out seeker missiles everything all at the same time one cool trick you can do that Ryung is doing is if you get something of yours seeker missile, you can actually just fly it right back into his army. Or you can even seeker missile your own stuff and fly it into his army specifically. So that it's a lot harder for them to dodge. So these seeker missile battles are pretty weird, but uh, one, I guess this was kind of a mistake of Dream to target one of the Banshees, because they don't really matter in these fights. And the Banshees, if they just fly right back in the middle of the clump here, then you're kind of shooting yourself with your own seeker missiles. Uh, it's a pretty interesting little set of events. So let's see how this breaks down. Seeker missiles on everything. The Banshees didn't really get the connections they wanted to. But right now, most importantly, Ryung is definitely winning the air battle right now with way more Vikings than Dream has since he took such a huge hit from those Ravens. And only a few battle crews are standing, and this should be pretty easy for Ryung to pick apart. If you're Dream, you really should realize what's going on and start to fall back here because you can't afford just to keep fighting like this. Especially because Ry Ryung has better upgrades since he was the mech player. So. Despite the battlecruisers being out, Ryung still won that fight. Uh, uh, Dream still had the bigger bank, so he's resupplying in more battlecruisers right now. And uh, Ryung still just going to continue doing what he's doing, and that is maintain the air lead with Ravens and with Vikings. One scary thing, though, is that you can't be on only on Raven Viking, because if your opponent switches back into something like a ton of Marauders, then you have absolutely nothing to stop that. So keeping up the Banshee production, even after those type of fights, is definitely important as well. There's a, you kind of need to balance it out. You need to look at this and say, I have a lot of Vikings. I know that he doesn't really have any Vikings. I don't have any Banshees and I don't have any Ravens. So I should probably be producing Banshees and Ravens after this point. Just to make sure that this air composition is still balanced as we go forward. So four more battle cruisers on the way for Dream like we talked about. He's starting to lose his base to a random Banshee over here. And uh, we've basically seen our, burst, our first big late game TVT fight. Both these guys resupplying as fast as they can, and uh, Ryung getting the Ravens out right now. I wish we would see more Ghost play, because that's something you don't see very often, or at least not enough. Let's also talk about another good way that Dream could start to get an advantage here. He knows that his opponent has a lot of Vikings. We can see that there's just tons here. There's, what, 20 Vikings here? He can start actually supporting his army with more Thors, and if you can actually splash on top of these Vikings, then that's a good way to get rid of them as well. It's uh. The Thor attack definitely does have anti-air splash, so if you can get good hits on these Vikings with your Thors, then that can minimize the damage that they do to your battlecruisers. So that's one good way to support if you're just way, way behind in the Viking counters. Just switch your supply into something else that's going to deal with the Vikings pretty well. That can even be as far as things like mines, and you can try to burrow underneath their army. A lot of weird stuff can go on, but uh, you need to assess your position. Am I ahead or behind in the sky battles? And what can I do to get back into a favorable position? So a little bit of a drop here, and notice how much trouble Ryung is having because he just doesn't have many Banshees out right now, and his tanks are on the wrong position. So this drop's still doing quite a bit of damage, at least way more than it should. And I think Ryung is starting to realize that he can't continue to do this because he's been behind on mining the whole time, and Dream has been basically untouched for a lot of this game. Especially with all the extra command centers he has, he can drop as many mules as he really wants to. But uh, the, the, the army composition still kind of favors Ryung right now. Looks like this eventually did get cleaned up, maybe by some banshees or tanks or something. But uh, did eventually get cleaned up. Here's Ryung adding on his own fusion core, and you can do battlecruiser versus battlecruiser if you really want to. But they're really representing the long-term damage in this army. The, the most important thing is really being ahead in the Viking count, because Vikings will beat anything, assuming you have enough of them, but oh my god, that's a lot of battlecruisers. Nine battlecruisers actually make that ten. And this is the type of point where if every single one of these battlecruisers shoots their Yamato cannons, all of a sudden that's ten dead Vikings, and then winning the Viking battle from that point can be pretty easy. So. This game is getting completely out of control with the type of units we're seeing come down here. Here's a big flood of ravens here from Dream, just hoping that he can maybe get some seeker missiles or point defense drones down just to protect his battle cruisers and maybe to kill the entire other army. I have seen this in pro games. They will get up to like seven or eight ravens and they'll land seeker missiles on literally every single unit and everything will explode in one big battle. So ravens are definitely the, the bigger thing to be watching out for in these fights and that's why I really recommend Ghost to try and EMP these 
because if you EMP the Ravens and there are 200 gas, it just sits in the air and looks pretty. So uh, it's something we don't see very often, and I'm really not sure why, because they're really, really useful in deep, deep late game situations like this. So Dream's also starting to add some missile turrets here, realizing that he's in kind of a bad spot against these Vikings. It's being pushed back a little bit, but this is why you want to get Yamato, so that you can Yamato down a bunch of Vikings instantly and hopefully kill enough off to win the air battle. So th these are the super supreme late game type of compositions we're going to want to see in, in TBT, and this is getting pretty crazy. So just huge terrifying armies from both of these players. We're going to see it come to a, a head here in just a second, and I think this is it. So Seeker Missiles on everything, and if you're getting Seeker missile like this, you need to split up your army and not take all this damage, because if you lose all this entire clump of Vikings to a few Seeker Missiles, then the battle cruisers mop up and you're dead. Uh, so this takes a lot of practice to just click on the units that are red and just move them out of your army as fast as you possibly can, because if you just eat these shots, then you will just you your army will vaporize and you'll have nothing left over, especially against this huge amount of battle cruisers on the field right now. Uh, so both players just spamming out the Seeker Missiles, dropping a couple of point defense drones here and there. The point defense drones tend to matter less and less as the game goes on. It's really about Seeker Missiles and keeping your Ravens alive. Worst case scenario, Ryung can just fly away and maybe he can get away from the Seeker Missiles in time and that'll waste the energy on the Ravens. But at the same time, it'll take a lot of damage retreating from all the Vikings and stuff that Dream has here engaging as well. So let's watch this in all its glory and see what happens. Seen a lot of uh, Vikings not being split here from Ryung, and he's going to take a ton of damage, and bam! Everything is down in the red here for him. Yamato start to go off, killing absolutely everything, and this is why the Battlecruisers are strong. If you can get this high and land really nice Seeker missiles, LOL, the Battlecruisers mop up absolutely everything. And uh, yeah, that's, that's GG. Ryung knows he's dead, so... <laughs> These kinds of fights in StarCraft are really rare, but they're really fun to watch, and TVT is the one matchup that can offer you things like that. So I hope you guys enjoyed uh, that video, and I hope you know a lot more about late-game TVT now, at least enough to know what to do and what units are important and how to support those uh, types of different things. By the way, one thing I didn't mention is that if you're really desperate to try and deal with a huge battlecruiser count and you probably won't be able to do it, you can go for just a ton of widow mines with burrowing claw or tunneling claws and try to burrow underneath the battlecruisers. Something you will see every once in a while and that can actually eliminate a huge battlecruiser force in fairly little time, so another idea you can try out, but uh yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Check out more of my Terran tutorials down in the description. Uh, subscribe to the channel. Leave me a comment if you had, if you liked anything that uh, you saw in this video. Leave, leave a comment if you have any questions as well. I'm usually on top of uh, answering questions that are left down there, so check that out. But I will see you guys in the near future with more videos, so take care.